and, and talk about this remarkable woman here. I want to want to get some time here, and I hope that you're doing well today. And I want to kind of get some time here to talk a little bit about Shep and Weppet the second. She is a remarkable woman, a remarkable woman in history that I'm that I'm going to talk about and kind of jump into here. She was a part of the royal family of of Kush, the the famous 25th dynasty. And I know we like to call them the 25th dynasty of ancient Kemet, but they were really rulers of Kush that took over Kemet. So at the time when she was queen, when she was when she was a God's wife for a minute. She had a, a role that she played at the Temple of Karnak. Kush was really l- leading and over the largest and longest continuous country in, in the world at that time. It was all the way down, far down into like the fifth and sixth cataract of the Nile, going all the way up to, to the Delta, covering all that area the ancient Kushite people had taken over. And she was a part of that royal family. So I'm, I'm going to jump into that. And as we start talking about her, just to give you an idea, she was a member of the famous family. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. We're going to talk a lot more about this family. But, but Kashta was the king who was in Kush, who began to unite the, the upper and lower part of, of, uh, of Kush. So he was somebody in, in the eighth century BC where he was basically joining all of Kush, upper and lower Kush. So not only was his father very, very poignant and very, very important when it came to uniting the Southern part of Kush in the Sudan, but Kashta came around and he began to push into lower Nubia and going all the way into what would be Southern Egypt, Southern Kemet. So he was somebody who was around and really kind of kicked off this dynasty that was already taking place in Kush and pushed them into the borders and into ancient Kemet. And so he became like the rule, if you will, the person to kind of, to establish this, this dynasty and people coming after him. And it would be his son, Pianchi, who you can see there in the blue, it would be Pianchi who would come and would begin to take over all of, all of Kemet. He would come and he would take over all of Kemet and he would begin to basically solidify the, what, what they call, what Egyptologists call the 25th dynasty. But it's really just an extension of a Kushite dynasty that was already in place, as I mentioned, with Kashta and people like that. And what happened was it was a significant thing because there was a role to play at the Temple of Karnak. When you think about the Temple of Karnak, it's this beautiful, beautiful place that has all of this, this magnificent, magnificent religious symbol and, and things that are, that are important. And at the time, it was probably one of the largest, if not the largest, continuous religious building in the world, the Temple of Karnak. And what happened was, under the 25th Dynasty, under Kostra's rule and Pianchi's rule, you can see there, they began to, to put more focus and more emphasis on a priestess's role at the temple of Karnak. So there was a role called the God's wife of a man. So it was literally someone who was supposed to be like God's wife, somebody who was really in charge, really running the temple of Karnak or somebody who was literally running the temple of Karnak. And it would be a woman. And it was typically maybe the daughter of the King or somebody closely related to the King, because she would be praying on behalf of the King. She would be praying on behalf of the country. She would be performing very important ceremonial roles as a part of, of her duties as God's wife of a man. So they called her divine con- divine wife, divine consorted, God's wife of a mender, very, various title, even God's hand that she was literally the hand of God in terms of how she interacted and what she did in her role at the temple of Karnak. Well, Shepard Weapon comes in in here because what happens when Pianchi takes over all of Kemet, and we're going to talk about Pianchi. We're going to give you the whole story of Pianchi and how he conquers everything from, from upper um, Kemet, the southern part of Kemet, up through Memphis. It's a wonderful, incredible story, a story that's really, that's really wrought, that's really built around a lot of morality. It's a lot of times when we hear stories about, about fighting and about conquering, we hear about, you know, stomping people under your, under your foot and, and killing them and showing no mercy. Yet in Pianchi's story, her brother here, um, he talks a lot about morality. He talks a lot about mercy. He talks a lot about how he's representing God by giving mercy to those who would turn themselves in or taking pride that he didn't kill everybody when he didn't have to. Some people, when you, you read these things in history, when they got to kill somebody, they kill everybody, you know, man, woman, and child. That's not what Pianchi did. And when Pianchi became the ruler of ancient Kemet, he helped to set in place several things. And so if you noticed here, it says first here on, on the yellow, on, on the right there, you see Aminadiris. And Aminadiris, Minertis is Aminadiris first. He's Pianchi's sister, Kostra's daughter. She's Pianchi's sister, Kostra's daughter. And she becomes God's wife of a man. And she would eventually transition her role to Shep and Weppet the second. So that would be her niece. So it would be Pianchi's sister at first, and then it would transition to Pianchi's daughter, Shep and Weppet the second. And so the reason why this is significant, and we know a lot about this, I'm going to kind of jump into it because this is a well-documented thing. And, and the interesting part about it is that the people in ancient Kush did a lot more to, 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 
solidify the role of women in their administration. And this is one of the big examples of why. So as we talk about this, it's well documented what happened with her and what happened with her successors. It's well documented. And I'll mention right now to those of you who are subscribers, if you subscribe to me here on YouTube and if you have access on Facebook, if you subscribe to me here on YouTube, you know, paid subscribers, membership is only $4.99 a month. This resource that I'm going to go over is, is up. It's up on the site. So you can go on the um, community tab that's for members only and see the, the password and everything and see that and be able to download this resource. But I went through and I kind of transcribed a whole documentation around what happened with Shep and Weapon II and partly what we know about why we know about what happened with her. So I'm going to go over it right now in the video, but if you are a subscriber, if you're a member, like I said, it's $4.99 a month. You can go download it now and you can take this and you can read this at your leisure on your own time. It, it's for free. It's a part of, of the membership. So, and thank you for those who are, who are members. I want to appreciate that and just kind of shout out to you. I very much appreciate what you're doing and your support so so much and hey team z thank you so much oh i'm looking uh i'm looking at your, your comment now yeah they do glaze over a lot of of kemet's history you know the ruling dynasties and where they came from especially the people who come from upper kemet you, you're absolutely right as i've been as i've been reading this Team Z, as I've been reading this, it seems like, you know, a lot of times people will, will argue, man, they want to argue about, you know, ethnicity and color and things like that. And it's more important for me to see what they were talking about. And we know that they were African society. We know what they were talking about. And it's important for us to be able to take from our ancestors and take from this 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 society and, and this this part of humanity what lessons we can apply to our life. But it's so funny because people will will talk about things and they just gloss over Upper Kemet. But when you think about Upper Kemet, because I'm thinking about what you the comment you made, Team Z, the, the, when you think about that, the first king, the Menzies, who's coming from, he's coming from the South. I mean, that that's written in, in the, the fifth dynasty as they talk about, and even in, as they talk about what was taking place with King Unos and how the, the, the white crown overtook the cobra overtook the white crown overtook the cobra the vulture overtook the cobra talks about the the upper part of Kemet coming and taking over the northern part of Kemet you can find that in the pyramid text is, is reference to that but when you get into the middle kingdom we know that the middle kingdom the people the dynasty that that started the middle kingdom came from the southern part of Kemet and we just gloss over it and we know what Mentuhotep looked like we know depictions of him we know that he had Nubian wives we know that he had Nubian soldiers in his army we know that but they just they just don't talk about that and when we talk about yeah, and when we and when they talk about the new kingdom, they just gloss over the fact that the new kingdom also came from the south. You know, it's not wrong. That's just where it came from, and we gloss over that, and we don't really show a variety, a broad segment of of depictions that they had of themselves. I mean, I was talking about that yesterday in one of the shorts that I posted, how even the depictions of people that they fought, the depictions of people that were in Western Asia or in other parts of, of the world that they interacted with, is very diverse. I mean, we don't even show that. <laughs> we just assume they looked one way, or if they were in Northern Africa or if they were in Western Asia, they must have looked a certain way. And that's not how they were depicted at all. When you look at the actual paintings and depictions, you see very dark colored people. You see people of all kinds of hues and they only want to show certain people when they're tied up, but they don't show you all the people they have tied up. So it's, it, it's very interesting. You're absolutely right. They, they just gloss over that part of, of, of history. And that kind of, kind of touched on a chord there. <laughs> so I went off on a tangent, but I think that's very much true. And you know, I start to find so much richness in Upper Kemet. We really should not just look at the pyramids of Giza that are significant and are wonderful, wonders of the world, really. It, not just look at them, but look at all of Kemet and look at all of its contributions and all of its diversity and all the things that came and not just kind of gloss over it and, you know, show a pot here or, or a piece of this here. So uh, I'll get off that and get back. So thank you so much for that comment. That's very true. So the upper part of Kemet becomes a focus, as you probably know, um, during the Kushite Empire, as well as during the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom. By the time the Kushites took over, you know, their capital, this is why I also say that it's not just that they're the 25th dynasty of Kemet. They are literally Kush extending into, into all of Egypt. They're taking over. So Egypt doesn't just become Egypt. Egypt becomes, Kemet becomes an extension of Kush because the, the rulers, the pharaohs, the kings of, of the Kushite Empire really kept their capital in Napata. So their capital was right there in Napata. They didn't move their capital. They still had centers of power, right? So Memphis was very important in the north. Obviously, Waset, where Thebes is, was very important with the Temple of Karnak, right there in the southern part of Kemet. But Napata was where they they had their power. Napata was where they had their strength. And they even had princes and people that they worked with in Meroway. So they had important cities throughout the entire expanse of, of their empire when they were controlling it. And so this becomes kind of kind of significant because what happens here when the Kushite people take over, 
they begin to put a really important significance on the God's wife of a man. And as I mentioned, I kind of document all that in this resource that I'm about to go over as we, as we talk about it. And they put a significance on women. I mean, when you see, when you look at ancient Kush, the role of women is not some cursier role. It's not something that they just look over how they look at their deities, how they look at the feminine aspect of God, how they look at, at, at the role of women. You have women playing roles in terms of generals and armies. You have women who are leading, as I mentioned, armies who are leading the country in their own right, not just because their husband passed away or not just because of whatever. They are leaders in their own right. Even the names that they have for some of their rulers don't have a feminine or masculine de, you know, denotation to it. They just have, it's a, it's a it's a title and you held that title, whether you were a man or a woman, but they, they had a really strong respect for women and women in ancient Kush had roles and did things that many of the women at that time. And even for even now really still don't do. There's still some places that don't allow women to be priests. There's still some places that don't allow women to rule countries. There's still some places that wouldn't allow a woman to, to lead an army, right? These are all things that Kushite women were doing thousands of years ago. And this woman was one of them. So she becomes, uh, Pianchi puts her, puts, has her, she's, she's already the, um, she, Pianchi puts her as the, as the next person who will become go God's wife of a man. And so that, that's a significant role. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit. When you think about the Temple of Karnak, it's a huge, huge facility. It's a massive facility. And, and when you are king and when you're ruling the, the, the kingdom, you have, you know, people that are subjects. But the person who is interceding on your behalf, the person who is praying on your behalf, most emphatically, most importantly, according to the, the people in Kemet at the time, was the person who was God's wife of men. And the God's wife of men essentially ran this temple. I mean, when you look at the, the documents, it's not that the priests weren't powerful. The priests were powerful. But when the Kushite kings put more emphasis on the God's wife of a man, the, it, the role took on even more of a significant role. And one of the ways we know that is how it transitioned. So apparently when a person became God's wife of a man, the current person who was in that role, the current priestess who was the head priestess and really basically kind of running the joint, she would have to adopt the next person. So she would adopt and take on as her daughter. Literally, they had like a written document that, that it was an adoption where she would take on the next person who would be assuming her role when she passed away and she would be, or, or whatever the change would happen, she would take that person and adopt her and bring her on as her daughter, as her great daughter. And they would, they would begin to keep on the, 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 the moving on and, and the process at, uh, with that perspective. So they begin to keep on the process as they move on. So what happened was, Pianchi's sister, Minodiris the first was the God's wife of a man. And then Shep and Wepet the second was given to her to adopt to so that she could be adopted so that she could be the next person. And then Aminodiris II, who was Taharka's daughter, was given to his sister, Shep and Weapon II, so Aminodiris II could be the next God's wife of men. So you can see this, this line, the succession of Kushite women who were in line for this role of God's wife of a man. But what happened was during the 26th dynasty, when the Assyrian Empire was killing people all over the place, the Assyrian Empire was, you know, destroying things in Babylon, all throughout you know, Western Asia, came down to, and commit and, and fought the Kushite people and basically pushed things back. And then in the 26th dynasty began to arise after that. During the 26th dynasty, it's interesting, this man right here, this is probably a bust of Samtik the first, and he was the third king of the 26th dynasty. This is a brother, and he is assuming control. And there's there's a period of time where there's there's disease, and there's a period of time because we talk about Mentu Hoptep, Mentu Hetep, Imhet, the other day, where he was a priest that took over in southern Kemet. But this gentleman right here ended up being control. He was in the northern part of Kemet, and he wanted his daughter to be the next God's wife of a man. So imagine this now. You know, the Assyrian Empire is basically backing him and, and setting up the people in the north because they're not very happy about the Kushite kings. They had already fought them. And so now he's way up north. He's assuming control. He's the third king of, of the 26th dynasty. And he wants his, his daughter now to be in the place where Shep and Weapon is. So she maintains power, even though the Kushite people are losing power and are moving back into Napata. She's maintaining power. And it shows you how important the role of this God's wife of a man was. It shows you how important because he... As he begins to do this, and I'll kind of kind of push forward in his document, he begins to to say, you know, I really want my daughter to do that. And so there's this document of Stela that indicates the adoption of his daughter by Shep and Wepet II. And in it, he walks through the process. It walks through the process about how his daughter would become the next God's wife of a man. And you couldn't just do this by like 
just he could have just rolled in there and say, I'm going to just, you know, kill everybody or kill Shep and Webbit and force her. That was not that was not what happened. It literally had to be even though he was taking control, even though the Assyrian army was was propping him up. He came to ask Shep and Webbit the second. And I don't know if she had much of a choice because the, the power was changing. But he came to ask to make sure that the ceremony still took place. He couldn't just come in and, and push his way because this was a temple. After all, this was a temple. This was a place that was a religious place. And to come in and just bowl your way in would probably make you lose respect amongst the priests, amongst the people who were there. You wouldn't be able to have somebody praying for you, right, on your behalf and really looking at you as a ruler if you just came in and, and, and bulldozed your way in and made Shep and Weppet leave. You had to follow the rules and follow the guidance with that. So he was essentially doing it. And I'm looking at some of the things. It, he was essentially doing that. And he was, you know, asking Shep and Weppet to... to to adopt his daughter. And so this adoption stela, that's what it's called, the adoption stela. And his daughter is called Necrotus, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. But he talks right here. And he talks about, you know, I am his son. He's talking about Amen. You know, and, and Amen is the father of gods and he knows my heart. And I am going to, I want to make sure that I have my daughter become the divine consort. He wants his daughter now to become God's wife of Amen. And so he's putting this on his stela just, you know, De declaring that and let everybody know that I want my daughter to become the God's wife of men. And he says, very importantly, I've heard it said that the king's daughter, Taharka, so he's talking about King Taharka, the Kushite king, that the king's daughter, Amenadiris II, had been adopted and that she was adopted by, by the current by the current Shep and Weapon II, the current God's wife of men, and that she is now the great daughter. And she's the person who's going to be the next God's wife of men. He's saying, you know, but I don't want to, I never want to like take a person away from an inheritance. I wouldn't want to take her inheritance away from her. God knows my heart. I would like to just as, Shep and Weppet was the great daughter and her father, Pianchi, you know, gave her, gave her to his, his niece, if you will. I want to give my daughter Necrotus to Shep and Weppet II so that she could be the next God's wife of a man. So this is literally Sam sick saying this, saying that he wants his daughter to be adopted and that Shep and Weppet II, you know, what she, he wants her to do that. And so it, it's interesting to me because this becomes a legal a legal document. It literally is written out. And you, all the priests are witnessing this. It's a whole big ceremony that takes place. Shep and Weppet the second and her niece, who was Taharka's daughter and her niece have to sign on to this. It doesn't happen. It doesn't take place without them signing on with them. Yeah. And I'm looking at Zala the Magnificent. Yeah. The Kushite, the Kemet, they had the most liberated women compared to other cultures. You're right. They, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing kind of what, what was taking place there. So what he does is it's a whole day adoption sale and you can almost imagine this. So imagine Shep and Weppet II. She's in the southern part of Kemet. She's at the Temple of Karnak. She's basically in control. And we'll tell you why we also know that right there in just a minute. She's basically in control. And Sam Tick wants his daughter to do that. And as he do, after he kind of makes his decree and is going to send a message to Shep and Weppet II, to ask her to adopt him, you know, he, he makes the announcement with his royal court. He, he does all that. And there's a whole procession. I mean, it talks about in year nine or the first month of the first season on day 28, his eldest daughter left from the king's family apartments. How is how she left? And there was a whole entourage with her. And it talks about her traveling down the Nile, you know, going toward the south, toward Waset, and she's traveling toward Karnak, Karnak. And she has a whole procession with her. She has her people who are going to be helping to basically serve her and support her. She has people who are watching over her, making sure she gets there safely. They're all traveling with her. And it's an entire procession that goes all the way down the, the Nile to Waset, to where the Temple of Karnak is. And this procession obviously takes, you know, time. It doesn't like take a couple hours to get there. It takes time. So it's a whole important grandly decorated bar boat that's going down there they're they're going upstream which is towards the south everybody's bearing very various new means crews they're mighty men they're soldiers coming with her they're all coming with her to go to the temple of karnak and when she gets there the people come out to meet her and shep and weapon is there and the priests are there and they understand she's going to be the next god's wife of a man but it can't just be done in any old kind of way it has to be done respectfully so she comes and she comes to shep and weapon and there has to be this this formal document that shep and weapon the second has to sign and she's basically making this new king <laughs> this new king's daughter her inheritor, the, the, the heir to her throne, the heir to all the stuff that she has, right? And what stuff does she have? Like, like, what do we know? And so they document, and this is like an incredible, it's like almost how do you even have all the stuff? So she receives her, the document talks about how she receives her, 
how she signs over and she said, you're going to be my great daughter. Now I am, I'm giving to you all the property, all of our property talking about on behalf of her, on behalf of Shep and Webb at the second right here and her niece, who was, who was her heir, who was the, her great daughter. We are giving you all of our property in our field in town. And what kind of stuff did they have? I mean, then it goes on to list all of this, all of the stuff that she's getting. It's, it's like a remarkable amount of stuff. They list district after district where they're talking. So a stat I believe is like, two thirds of an acre. So they're giving her 300 stats, which, you know, you're talking like 180 acres or something like that. They're giving her two thirds of an acre of times 300, if you will, um, uh, times 300 stats, if you will. And she's getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres from all these different places all around commit. And they, they, they knock this out. They talk about this uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you, Zizo. I'm excited. It, it, it's worth it's worth being excited over. They talk about how many did I want you to see this because as I looked through this, I was reading through this. I was just amazed to make you think of how much power and resources were at disposal for Comet. Not just Shep and Webb at the second, but all of Comet. Because if they could give her this, who else could they give stuff and how much did they have? So they're talking about hundreds and hundreds of acres of land from Her Heraclopolis and this and this district and and from Sep going all through all these districts where she's getting hundreds and hundreds of acres of land. And they list all the gnomes from the South that's giving her, her um, information and giving her all of this land that they're giving. And they're not just giving her the land, they're giving her the proceeds from the land. So she's getting whatever the, that land produces. So if they're producing some type of wheat or grains, if they're producing vegetables, they're giving, she's getting that. So that, that's what that is. So it's not just the land itself. She owns the land and the people who are working on the land are providing things to give to her for her to be able to administer Karnak. It's for her to be able to, to rule, to provide for herself, provide for the temple. And I assume also providing for the people who are working for her. It's a lot of stuff that they give the temple of Karnak. And so it goes on to talk about, so that's just, that's just land that she's getting from one part of, of Kemet. Then they talk about the first prophet, the fourth prophet of, of Karnak. Now, now think about this. As I think about it, we talked about the other day, I talked about this man right here, Minto Hopsep, Minto Hat. He was a very significant priest of our men in the temple of Karnak at the time Shep and Wepit was alive. And he's mentioned right here. This is him. This is who they're talking about, Mentum Hat. This, and he ends up continuing as a, his role. His role is really kind of like a governor, if you will. And in, in he's like a prince of Waset because at the time there was a transition between, between the Kushite people and the, the people of the 26th dynasty and the southern part of Kemet was kind of left without control. Well, this gentleman right here is mentioned in this document. And what does he have to give? give? What does he give to Shep and Webbit? And it talks about how he is, he is jumping into to, to the giving of her and he's given her a certain amount of bread. So these are, these are obviously ancient comedic, you know, units, if you will. He's given her all this type of, he's given her bread. So this is daily. Now I'm just, just check this. This is daily. He's giving her supposedly daily 200 Devon of bread, so many hen of wine, cakes, vegetables. This is what he had to give. And then what did he have to give monthly? Three oxen, five geese on a monthly basis. So that's just him. That's just the, 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 the fourth prophet of the, the prince, if you will, of Waset having to give to the Shep and weapon, which will now be given to his daughter. Um, so giving these, and then from his son. So he had to give this and then his son gave a hundred Devon of bread, wine, vegetables every day on a monthly basis, 15 cakes, 15, uh, 10 jars of beer. Not only that, his wife had to give. So here we have Mentu, Mentu Mhep, and he is, he is given, not only he has to give, but his son has to give, his wife have to, has to give. All of this is happening here. And so then you also have, she's giving a certain amount of muff, and then you keep going on, and then you have the high priest. So this list goes on and on. The high priest are giving something every day. The other, the second priest is giving something every day. The king of Kemet, even the king gives something to God's wife of a man. So when, we, when I start to look at this and you start to say, wait a minute now, that's a lot of, that's a lot of resources. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of land. That's a lot of food. A lot of valuable resources are going to the temple of Karnak, specifically to God's wife of a man for her to administer the, the temple and, and whatever she's going to do with it. And, and this is actual a document that Shep and Webbett is signing along with her niece over to the new, the new God's wife of a man, his daughter. So she, they're, they're writing this all out in a legal document. It's amazing that she has this wow, that she has this much stuff and this stuff, this much stuff is giving. And it gives you an idea of the power of God's wife of a man of the temple at Karnak and that she was really the most significant person. I mean, when you really start to look at it and read it, it appears she's the most significant person outside of the King. When you think of all of Kemet and you think of those, cause you would think the priests are significant 
But the priests are bowing and deferring, giving deference to the God's wife. I mean, at this time, during the Kushite time, they're giving deference to the God's wife and whoever's in that role. And this is a Kushite woman. So it would make her one of the most powerful people in comedic history. Now, people won't mention her name. They certainly don't talk about her. But, you know, show me somebody else who's getting this type of resources and has this type of command and not just kind of a cursory role. She has a significant role in Kemet. And a significant role that she starts to talk. So God bless you. Thank you so much, Harold Morris. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, well, Shep and Weppet would be not quite the daughter, but she was. Um, she was. She was actually a part of the Kushite family. So we could talk more about this. So I appreciate. I appreciate your comments. That's. Um, I appreciate that, Harold Morris. So she, she begins to. She begins to also take into account not only the stuff that that's coming from the king who's giving her giving her gifts, if you will. You also have the temples. So as I mentioned, this is the temple of Karnak. And when you start to talk about temples in ancient Kemet, they're significant. Even the temple at Memphis is giving gifts to the God's wife of men. Even the, the very famous temple at Memphis, which is you know, the temple of Ptah, which is where Ptah is, is the, seat, the seat of Ptah, is giving information and giving resources to God's wife of men in Karnak. And it tells you about why and how this was a significant, a significant place. And these are the temples. This is a list right from the document from the Stela of, of what the temples are giving. So the temples, whether it's in Buto or Memphis or various places up and down north, Tanis, they're all giving resources to God's wife of men. And this, these are more lands. Mm -hmm. Then you have lands in the north. They're all turning around and they're giving resources to God's wife of men. So I wanted to kind of stop there and, and just mention and talk about Shep and Wep at the second, because she's a significant person. And, and you mentioned there, Team Z, I appreciate it. You mentioned how they gloss over a lot of people's names. They gloss over, and I showed you the kind of the, the family tree before, they gloss over a lot of people's names who were important in ancient command. It's almost like we have more documented history about ancient Kemet almost than any other ancient society. I mean, the, the museums all over the world are filled with documents and resources about ancient Kemet. And we have had for well over 100, more than 100 years, a lot of this stuff translated and all kinds of things written. We have this information, but we somehow can't talk about it but a few people. We somehow don't remember people's name. We somehow don't show their face, their faces when we get up and we, we see Sam Sick, Sam, Sam Thick the first, and we see Shep and Weppet, and we see people, black people, we see people of Kushite origin we just don't talk about it. and a lot of times I hear about ancient Kush I will hear things about maybe Pionk maybe Taharku but I never hear about his sister I never hear about his aunt I never hear about his daughter you very rarely hear about his dad or his dad's dad these are all significant people and like I said, we just gloss over them. So I just wanted to lift her name up today. I wanted to introduce you to Shep and Weppet a second. I'll be talking more about her. I may be doing something more about her tomorrow because there's more resources that I can share. But I wanted to lift her names up today. I wanted to make it so that we don't forget her, that we talk about her. Yeah, the world, the world's oldest civilization and, and, and well-documented society. You're absolutely right. It's, it is. It certainly is. And we just, we just don't talk about it. There's so many societies that we don't talk about. But I wanted to, to lift up Shep and Weber today, and I wanted to lift up her name. And I just, I just ask and pray that you share it with somebody. Share this information. Share this resource. Share this, this actual video. You know, send it to somebody. Share it. Like it. It helps me more. It helps me get subscribers. helps me get more information. Here. Let's talk about it. Let's remember her today. And God bless you. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.